Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to It Will Come To Me podcast. Izzy, what's going on? <laughs> uh, nothing. Um, we have book club on Thursday, so I've I've been behind, so I downloaded like the Audible version and I'm just listening as I'm driving to and from work because that's two hours of my life I could be using differently. What book? What book? Uh, it's called The Midnight Library. Oh, I by... heard that one. I That's on my TBR. Yeah, it's by Matt Haig. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. It's a cool idea. I feel like I've watched a TV show with the same concept, basically the in-between of life and death. And the main character, Nora, gets to relive certain regrets that she has and then gets to see that type of version play out. So it's kind of, it's a cool concept. It's very philosophical. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's very <Yeah>. good. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> It's very philosophical. So like you would open up and you'd be like, okay, I chose this path, but if I chose path B instead, what would have happened? Where would yeah. my life go? Got it. Exactly. She's kind of sort of like time traveling to her regrets to see how it would have played out had she went through certain decisions, like actually getting married to her boyfriend. She was like in love, not in love, but she obviously she loved her cat very much, Voltaire, or she called him Volti. <laughs> Um, Because he wasn't sophisticated enough for Voltaire. She's like, oh, show me a version where he's actually alive. And, or no, she, so this woman that's supposed to be kind of her, I guess, guide uses a lot of like play on words and tricks. And she's like, so Nora goes, can you show, give me a version where my cat is indoors? Because I guess he was an outdoor cat and that's how he died. So spoiler she, alert. <laughs> spoiler alert. So she sends so she sends her back in time where the cat is indoors, but he still dies. And she's like, Why'd you do that? And she goes, Well, because no matter what version you asked, he's always gonna die. He had like a disease. <laughs> she's like, That was so mean. <laughs> so I feel like she's her her guide that's kind of a little manipulative in that sense. Like she's not being very concrete it's with her words. Out. Yeah, she's being like very like wishy-washy and she's like very, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> I just couldn't get over that cat. But well, no, it's, now it's that I know book. what is happening, maybe I'll take it off my to be. You tell me if it's worth it or not at the end. Okay, I'm halfway there. No, it's good. And I also, so the Audible version, it's Carrie... Mollyhan, what's her name? Damn it. The girl from The Great Gatsby, the one who played Daisy, her? Yes, yeah, Carrie okay. Mulligan. So she narrates it and it's a very thick British accent. And I just, I, I don't know why. I just, I can't, I can't listen to it all the time. So I have to, you know, it's a good thing that my drive is only 40 minutes or an hour back. So I can digest it a little bit. But uh, tomorrow I'm going to have to do some catching up. Anyway, okay. so what what what's going on with you? I know you're you're an avid reader, so what are you reading these days? I am reading The Song of Achilles, which I love so far. I think it's very good. And I actually just went to the bookstore today on my day off and I bought Daisy Jones and the Six oh, because it nice. has been on my TBR for the last year. And now that it's coming to Hulu or Netflix or whatever the hell streaming service it is next month. I want to read it before I, I'm able to watch the show. Cool. Isn't isn't Elvis Presley's great- granddaughter? Yeah. Oh, it's granddaughter. Yeah. She's granddaughter. in it, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Cool. Riley Keo. Co? Co? I don't fucking know. I feel like there are a lot of TV shows now becoming ad- adopted from the books. So I'm kind of curious to see. There's another yeah. one. Um, it's like the last thing he told me. I, I read that book. I'm curious to see what it does. The, uh, Reese Witherspoon does mm-hmm. with it. First of all, let's talk about Reese Witherspoon. Yeah, she's <laughs> fucking killing the game right now. In, I love her. Yes, in in her production company, Sunshine or Sunshine Production, whatever it is. Yeah. Oh my god! But the last thing that he told me, it was good. Mm-hmm. It wasn't something I'd be like, oh my god, I absolutely loved it. I'd read it again. Okay, I gifted it to my mom because I thought it was it sounded kind interesting. of predictable. Oh, at the yeah. end, yeah. Okay. I kept tell I kept asking my mom, oh, like, do burn. you have the book? I'm like, do you have the book? Did you read it? She's like, you think I remember from a year ago what you gave me and what it's about? And I'm like, Jesus, okay. 
<laughs> assemble no would have sufficed, yeah, Mom. Assemble no would have been enough. <laughs> yes, you didn't really like that book. All right, moving on. <laughs> I actually wanted to talk today about women because when this episode airs or when it will air, it will be International Women's Day. I saw women in the news recently over the last few weeks that were really making headlines that I think are really worthy. Actually, March is Women's History Month too. Well, there you go. So it's yeah. perfect. I wonder, Women. but do you know, do you know what like the difference is? Like, why do we have a specific International Women's Day versus the whole month? I think it started with International Women's Day. And then they were like, you know what? We'll just give women their own month at this fucking point. Uh, when did you start celebrating International Women's Day? Or become aware of it? Honestly, I only became aware of International Women's Day maybe in the last decade. A little less. Yeah, same. Yeah. You know, actually, it's funny because I was in China and a friend of mine was like, oh, I want to take you out because it's International Women's Day. I'm like, come again? <laughs> I like, I never, that. yeah, I literally, I never even heard of it before. And I was like, okay. And, you know, what seemed to be an innocent considering day <laughs> turned out to be kind of awful because I lost my wallet. And that ended up us in having to go to a Chinese police station and trying to translate or tell them what went on and, like, make a report. And the whole time they were just, like, asking me stupid questions about being American and, like, oh, if we were engaged or if we were dating and why we didn't have kids yet. And I was like, oh, Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah. Women! (laughs) yeah exactly i was like jesus i'm never celebrating this day ever again (laughs) so i was just i was curious to to know (laughs) yeah (laughs) i was just curious to see like if you i don't celebrate it celebrating it i don't think a lot of women well i no i'm not putting words in other women's mouth i think women celebrate it it's just it become more heightened over the last couple of years because of the help of social media. Yeah, probably. So going back to some of these women that I wanted to talk to you that I saw about the news, I'm like, oh my God, look at these women kicking ass. And then that's when I realized like, oh, this is perfect because International Women's Day is coming up. So let's, you know, put some light on women that it's not yeah. negative for once. The Super Bowl just happened. Go Chiefs. Woo! <laughs> going to piss a lot of people off there. So you know the flyover that's been a part of the Super Bowl history, and it's a really big deal. During the national anthem, they have the fighter jets fly over. No. This past – oh, well, oh, actually no. I don't know. I literally know nothing about football. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. So <laughs> during the national anthem, they have a like a flyover, whether they're fl- fighter jets, the B-52s, the bombers, and it's just part of – NFL tradition, it's like kind of get people hyped up. It's very patriotic because in in this country, we're all about being like patriotic, which is fine. But it's a really cool sight to see if you haven't seen it, if you've got to go. They don't, and they don't do it for every game. I don't know what their selection process is, so don't ask me. But this year, this Super Bowl that just happened marked the first time that there was an all-women flyover celebrating mm-hmm. 50 years of women in the Navy. Which is wow. pretty badass. Yeah. Look at these yeah, women go cool. in the Navy. Do they have, what is it called when the, the boys come back from like their, their time at seas? There's like the the specific Navy day. The Naval some, Week. At the New Naval City. Week. Is there something like that for women? I don't know, but I'm sure because equality, it's probably both men and women. It's probably both Naval Week for both genders. Nah, I'm kind of curious now. <laughs> what are you going to do? I don't know. Go support them. Oh, okay. All right. Because you're like, because I, because, you know, in New York City, it's it's Naval Week and these women go feral. So I, I didn't know if you were trying to tell me something. <laughs> no. no. I was just curious. Okay, that's fine. No judgment. And then speaking of the Super Bowl, the quarterback for the Eagles, so it was between the Eagles and the Chiefs, the quarterback for the Eagles, Jalen Hurts, mm-hmm. had an all-female management team. From his female agent to his marketing team. And this was also the first ever. So that was pretty cool. And then the other woman that I just saw recently in the news. Her name is Sarah Techman of the Wellcomer Sanger Institute 
and the Department of Physics of the University of Cambridge, UK. So she was a recipient of the Phoebe's Women in Science Award. She Mm -hmm. was being recognized for her work in three scientific areas, protein assemblies, regulation of gene expression, and most recently, single cell phenotyping include mapping of immune cells. Don't ask me what any of that means. Again, (laughs) science is not my thing. But she was able to do some single cell phenotyping. And Hmm. I think that's amazing. That sounds intense and very sciencey. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So good on you, girl. It's called Fleet Week. And that is it. Fleet Week. There is one for women, obviously. Because, yeah, because if they're overseas and they come back, then why not? Right? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I never actually saw like women in the Navy. Like, I've seen men in the uniform, but I've never seen the women in the uniform. So that's kind of interesting. So what is International Women's Day on March 8th? I don't know. Like, I don't know really the history of the day. Like I said, I only really started hearing about it, like you said, like in the last decade. And even then it wasn't like, okay, I heard about it. It's not like I did anything about it. I posted maybe a few times on Instagram, like celebrating women in my life, but I don't really know where it stemmed from. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the right off the women's website, the International Women's Day website. This is the most clear, concise definition. International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating women's equality. The first IWD in 1911 was supported by 1 million people. Wow. So it's been around for quite a while. And I, like I said, I didn't really know of it except for the last decade. And I think that unless you're an activist or you're really a part of your community, I don't think people really know about certain like days. But then again, in all fairness, we have a day for fucking everything. And, you know, we got into this conversation at all. But yeah, I, feel we like did. This one, <laughs> I feel like this one's pretty important. Mm -hmm. So then I decided to maybe, you know, I kind of wanted to do some research about feminism and modern day feminism versus traditional feminism, where we are today. And I need to be totally honest, there is not enough acid in the world that can make me go down that rabbit hole right now. (laughs) Because holy shit, man, there is so much information. And I feel like that can be an episode in the future and in, in itself. Holy mother of God. All these different websites, these different articles, some were very like in the middle, very factual. Others leaned left. Others leaned very right. Others leaned extremely one way and extremely the other. And you're like, it was it was crazy. So without getting too much into feminism, are like and and what all that means in the most basic term, I guess, are you a feminist? And what does that mean to you? Well, this episode just took a turn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Mean the simplest answer for right now. <clears throat> no, I don't view myself as. A feminist in the terms of what it has become now or what I see it to be now, which is like propaganda against all men pretty much. Because I yeah. I know that when it was first – the first inception of feminism and like the idea behind it, I, I totally am behind it and I'm, I'm all yeah. for it. And that's, you know, being equal to certain standards that the men are – I don't know how to explain it. Obviously – Back in the 50s and the 60s, women were not – they didn't have the rights the same as men do. And so I feel like that's where a lot of the feminist movement came in. It was to work towards having those same standards pretty much and being viewed as an equal, being viewed as having the same value as a man in society and saying, we can vote, we can work, even though we are – bearing children even though we're doing a lot of housework like we're still human beings that need to be recognized aside from just bearing kids anyway what I'm trying to say is that I totally understand the feminist movement as it were a couple decades ago now I don't know what the fuck it's become honestly I I feel like it's just an excuse to say men suck (laughs) because I have this conversation with my husband all the time and he's (laughs) 
He's not one to like mansplain or he he likes to see both sides of the coin essentially and be kind of a devil's advocate. And he's like, well, if women want equality, then why don't they take the jobs that men do? And I'm like, like what? And he's like cleaning out the garbage, sanitary. Yeah, I don't see women on that truck. It's just men. Yeah. And yeah, you can argue that, uh, well, physically men are stronger and you need to be stronger in order to handle the loads of garbage and put it in the machine and put it out of the machine, whatever. I just remember an instructor of mine saying that in order to treat people equally, you have to see their differences as well. And I feel like that's very true to men and women. Yeah. You can say like physically and biologically men are stronger. They're built a different way for certain things. So that's a clear difference, right? It's not to say that women can't be strong. But yeah. biologically, it's just probably not possible. You're born different. You're, it's a different species. Yeah. It's a different animal, you know? Like, and I, I understand that. And I think just different societal roles or different standards and different perceptions have put us kind of in a pigeonhole saying like, oh, well, women can only do certain professions than men can. That went on for too long. You know what I mean? Because like even in my field, like advising, I don't, (laughs) we have one guy in the office and that he's not even like doing what we're doing. (laughs) It's all women. It's all women. Um, You can say the same thing about, you know, nurses or psychologists or the more, um, inherit roles where you have to be more nurturing and and more about counseling and talking about people's psyche it's it's always been reserved for the woman but for the men it's been more about the heavy load the construction right um or working in stem and that has changed i think there's a lot more encouragement now for women to be in the stem related fields and again that's through change and that's through you know revolutions and that's through education systems and anyway that's my long way of saying that i believe in the true mission of feminism but i honestly it's morphed into something that i don't recognize anymore yeah. Um and it, I think social media and has made it a little bit more worse. But yeah, anyway, what do you think? <laughs> I think a lot of women probably feel the way you do. And that's why I kind of wanted to ask because I think we should definitely have a a conversation about modern day feminism versus traditional mm-hmm. feminism and what it means and why is it alike and why is it different. But again, it's a rabbit hole, man. I, in a very quick sense, I am, but just like you, I don't know too much about modern day feminism, but my views in feminism is like, whatever a woman wants to do, it's her Mm -hmm. right to choose. And don't condone her because her decisions are not yours. But I just feel like, why are we even having conversations about it though? Like, why can't it just be something we do? You know what I mean? I feel like in this day and age, like you really shouldn't have to explain yourself why or why not you want to have kids. Why or why not you decide to be a stay at home mom? Why or why not you're deciding to be a career woman, career boss, whatever. Like, lady boss. It's just, yeah, lady boss. I feel like as a society, we're just making issues much bigger than they actually are. Yes. And I know like these conversations were not being had decades ago. And I understand that. It's just, it's so much different now. And like people can do whatever the fuck they want. I think society also holds a double standard. Um, Yeah. And I agree with you. I don't understand why we have to keep like having these conversations. I think these conversations are important, but to have them all the time, like you should be able to just live your life. And not have to explain anything. And I think also with social media, over the last decade, we have been so accustomed to being owed explanations through Facebook posts or Instagram posts. So now as a society, we're like, okay, so why do you want to be a stay-at-home mom? Or why do you want to be a working mom? Or why don't you want to have kids? You know, it's really crazy too, because after I had kids and I, I really entered the the corporate workforce, do you want to know who was asking me who was watching my kids? Your mom? No. Who? Other women co-workers. Are you serious? Um, all the men who were, I had who were co-workers never asked me that question. They never once was like, oh, so you're here. Who's watching your kids? It was only women. And I always thought that was so funny because- it's like maybe I, they I'm were here. just maybe they their intention wasn't 
to upset you or offend you. Maybe it was no, just like genuinely asking you because they might be in the same boat or no, they well, might that's what want, I'm saying. It was never yeah. it was never an offense to me. I just thought it was so funny that I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Who do you think's watching my kids? The same person. It's either daycare or like your mother in law or your mom. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. only one of like three people. I got my au pair from France. Like Jesus fucking Christ. So back to International Women's Day. Kind of just wanted to talk about a couple of names that might not be household names, but they should be. They're definitely not Oprah. They're not Beyonce. They're not Lady Gaga. They're not fucking Hillary Clinton. Is I- Hillary Clinton even considered like, I mean. She I- is like the super feminist of today's icon, which makes no sense. Okay. And like I like Beyonce, but I don't understand why people think like she's also the feminist movement. Like she is feminism. No, she's not. But again, there are other women who are actively being activists every day for women and for women's causes. And they're not even close to being a household name or they're just somebody mm. in your local community. Because they're not always in, in the media. They're not famous. Yeah. They're not actresses. They're not singers. So it's who less cares, exposure. Right? Yeah, who cares? And they won't know their names. <laughs> like, So the first name that came to um, fruition that I researched, her name was Andre De Jong, And I probably butchered that. But... Um, she went by Dee Dee. Uh, she was a countess and was a member of the Belgium resistance during the Second World War, organized and led the comic line that helped Allied oh. airmen get safely through Nazi-occupied Belgium and France over the Pyrenees and into Spain and Gibraltar. At just 24 years old, Dee Dee saved 118 out of nearly 700 men in her 24 missions. And although she confessed to the Germans, Regarding her involvement in the resistance, they did not believe her and sent her to the concentration camp. Post-war, Dee Dee finished her nursing studies and worked in the Congo, Cameroon, Ethiopia, and Senegal to help and find treatment for lepers. Okay, two questions. Yes. So she was involved in the resistance and willingly told the Germans about it. And they didn't believe her. And she was sent to a concentration camp. She would have. Okay. But if even if they did believe her, they would have reprimanded her for it anyway. Yeah. Well, that's. I I assume so. It's why she was sent to a concentration camp. So what does it matter if they believed her or not? (laughs) Fuck do I know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Just. Yeah. I I just thought it was. No. I just thought it was really interesting how she. So, okay, this is why I kind of picked her because remember the conversation we had like last week about rare disorders and then I asked her, well, after she found God and God told her that there was a bigger picture for her and I'm like, well, what did she do? And then you were like, well, you know, sometimes it's just people not doing great things. It's just them being able to tell her truth. This is a girl that was sent to concentration camp on the verge of total, like she probably could have died if she wasn't Mm -hmm. um, liberated. And then she went on to help lepers. To help leopards? <laughs> lepers. Treat? Treat, what? sorry. God. She went on to treat lepers. So she got a second chance at life and she used it to do something bigger than her. So mm-hmm. that's kind of, it reminded me of that whole conversation God, I had. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty. There are so many people who helped during World War II and they, they were part of the resistance. They worked underground. They helped mm-hmm. uh, move children, incredible people, incredible women and men that helped uh, yeah. make sure to bring people to safety during World War II. So that's, but yeah, that's kind of cool of her. Yeah. Okay. Who else you got? All right. So Ang San Suu Kyi. Mm-hmm. Not sure. If I, again, I'm probably going to butcher Is all these Is she Korean? Things. That sounds Korean. No, she's Burmese. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she was a Burmese politician, diplomat, author, and a 1991 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, which I don't know how that's different from a winner, who served as a state counselor of Myanmar, equivalent to a prime minister. So mm-hmm. um, she was also the prime minister of foreign affairs from 2016 to 2021. She had served as the chairperson of the National League of Democracy, NLD, since 2011, um, having been the general secretary from 1988 to 2011, 
And then she played a vital role in Miramar's transition from military juncture to partial democracy in the 2010s. Mm. So this graceful woman who armed with only the principle of nonviolent resistance, um, she stood up to the generals who have controlled Burma for nearly five decades. So for 15 of the past 21 years, the military regime kept her locked up. But if the general, but the generals wished like for her to kind of fall into obscurity, they failed because she's still active today. Like she's still activist and fighting for Burma and just women's rights in Burma. Nice. I think there was, I think there's still something going on with that Myanmar government. Yeah. Right now. I think there's a coup going on and there's like a lot of people are seeking asylum. I think it's it's going on for for a long time now, like all the conflict with the military. Yeah. So the next woman is Amelia Bloomer and she might be my new hero. So Amelia, because you talked about the early feminist movement. So like the suffragists. Right, Mm -hmm. from like Susan B. Anthony in the 1800s. So she was an early suffragist, editor, and activist, but mostly remembered for being an advocate in women's clothing and changing women's styles. Hmm. So born in Homer, New York, but moving to Seneca Falls in 1840, she was was once married, and that's kind of why they moved. So Bloomer quickly became active in the Seneca Falls political and social community, She joined a church and volunteered with the local temperance society. Noticing his wife's fever for social reforms, her husband David encouraged her to use writing as an outlet. And as a result, she started a column which covered a plethora of topics. And I just want to point out that this was also 1840 and her husband was like, yeah, you love politics? Write your shit down. (laughs) Like, yay, go David. Go David! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. So then in 1849, she created The Lily, a newspaper solely dedicated to women. Hmm. Um, at first, it only addressed the temperance movement, but after high demand, it covered other issues as well. So now here we go. Bloomer's most influential work was in dress reform. After noticing the health hazards and restrictive nature of corsets and petticoats, Bloomer pushed for women to adopt a new style of dress, the pantaloons. Hmm. Now called Bloomers, not only illustrated a departure from the accepted dress for women, the garments also came to represent activists in the women's rights movement. And like, good on her. Because imagine still wearing petticoats and corsets in 2023. Never. Fuck that. I would wear a corset for, like, a special event or when, like, the occasion calls for it. <laughs> but, but oh, my God, no way. And then to wear dresses all the – like, I love a good dress, especially in the summer, like a sundress. But they wore, like, dresses. Like, they had, like, all those layers. You had, like, a slip and then an underskirt and then, like, a the tulle, the tulle skirt. Mm-hmm. And then they had their skirt and then they had the corset. No, fuck that. Yeah, that's so. – no. So during the Civil War, Bloomer started the Soldiers Aid Society of Council Bluffs to help Union soldiers. You got to love these weird ass names that she comes up with. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who's naming them, but come on. Just I would never name. remember that. I would never remember that. Okay, go ahead. The Soldiers Aid Society of Council Bluffs. Like I don't, what the what, what does that I even mean? Well, she moved to, I mean, she didn't, I didn't put it in here, but she moved to Council Bluffs, Iowa, I think it was. So it's of the town. So it's really Soldiers Aid Society of the town she lives in. Of the town. Okay. That makes more sense. Yeah. So until her death in 1894 at the age of 76, Amelia preached women's suffrage and the temperate movement, a true feminist to the end. So Mary McLeod Bethune was born in 1875. She was the daughter of former slaves, and she became one of the most important black educators, civil and women's rights leaders, and government officials of the 20th century. The college she founded set educational standards for today's black colleges, and her role as an advisor to to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave African Americans an advocate 
in government. Hmm. Yep. Her f- actually, her family were like cotton. They grew cotton in the South because she was born in South Carolina. Which, which, um, oh, so the, the black universities are in South Carolina? No, just, I mean, the black universities are all over. So, okay. um, so she, in 1894, she graduated from uh, Scotia Seminary, a board school in North Carolina. And then she attended Dwight's Moody, Dwight Moody's Institute for Home and Foreign Missions in Chicago. Um, she moved to Florida where she worked at a Presbyterian church and also sort of sold insurance. And I feel like selling insurance was just like the thing to do in the early 1900s because it was like door to door salesman. And I feel like, oh, you're not going to go to college. You're going to go sell insurance. Like, mm. I, I don't know yeah. if anybody. Ha- yeah. I mean, they st- they still have that as a profession today. It's just not as. I mean, it's not door to door. We all like, you know, yeah. we're all. I, no, actually, there's still door to door, like the solar f- panels people that come knocking on our door every freaking month. But that's not insurance. It's just no, it's not insurance. But yeah. I'm still saying there are still door to door professions out there, especially during elections too. And oh, the Mormons. Can we talk about the Mormons for a second? <laughs> Lucas. Oh my God. So I was at work and Lucas <laughs> texted me and he was like, "Well." coronavirus is no longer a concern the mormons are back <laughs> i'm like oh jeez um or jehovah's Wait, like, uh, they have like spies everywhere i'm telling you because the minute we got the house they started knocking on our door like non-stop oh my god that's so funny so she moved to florida she, like how it said she sold she worked at presbyterian church she sold insurance um but her marriage ended so in order and determined to support her son, um, she opened a boarding school and the Daytona Beach Literacy and Industrial School for Training Negro Girls. Hmm. Not really sure if I could say that in 2023, but it's not a bad word. I mean, that's what the school's called. So whatever. We got to keep going. Eventually, her school- Is it still- Is that what it's still named today? I don't think so. It okay. doesn't say. I got to look it up. Um, eventually Bethune school became a college merging with all male Cookman, uh, with the all male Cookman Institute to form Bethune Cookman college in 1929. It issued its first degree in 1943, but then really important, most importantly, a champion of racial and gender equality. Bethune founded many organizations and led voter registration drives after women gained the right to vote in 1920 risking racist attacks. Um, In 1924, she was elected president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And in 1935, she became the founding president of the National Council of Negro Women. Um, She also played a role in the transition of black voters from the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, to the Democrat Party during the Great Depression. During all her um, political advocacy she herself was a friend of eleanor roosevelt um she so she became the highest ranking african-american woman in government when president franklin roosevelt named her director of negro affairs of the national youth administration so it's kind of cool i mean i don't think i would use any of those titles now yeah definitely Um, not (laughs) yeah but i think that's pretty kick-ass so yeah yeah i feel like there's so many women in history that contributed one way or another and like you said you can kind of spiral and go into oh, it yeah. a lot and yeah there's a lot of history obviously like with just you kind of going over her history I mean it's those titles are true to her history you know what I mean like they're still yeah. important uh, for us to understand why it was significant oh, um, of course. obviously now the textbooks and you know, <laughs> literature is going to change that um but that's but it I is feel part like- of history. It is important to know that this is what she did and what the purpose of it was. Yeah. And I feel like, like you said, textbooks are going to take those titles and they're going to be like, no, we got to erase those. But I think those are very important to understand. In order for history not to repeat itself, you must learn from your history. So the, her title of the Negro Girls Institute or the of Negro Affairs, like being the mm-hmm. head of Negro – yeah, it's not a great word, but those are the words you use. And then she probably held that title very proudly. 
I can yeah. only imagine, right? So yeah. I wouldn't take any of those away in history and scrub those words. Yeah, I think we we can go into a whole other discussion about like linguistics yeah. and why language is, preservation is important. And I mean, this is a huge part of history. And so like now you wouldn't use it, obviously, because it's a negative connotation. So what, the last one I'm going to talk about is her name is Amani al Kahatbe. She started pioneering a publication for like by and for Muslim women. Mm-hmm. Um, just because again, I'm trying to cover women from all different work, walks of life here. She gained recognition on Forbes 30 under 30 list. She's actually from New Jersey, but she's very vocal about what real life issues facing Muslim is she, women. Is she still alive? Yeah, no, she's alive. Oh, okay. She's our age. Oh, she's, she's oh. Fr- no, she's younger than us. She's from nine. She's born in 1992. So if you don't feel accomplished, fuck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't. I was going to say, like, after this episode, I'm going to feel so down because I haven't accomplished shit. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> she was born in New Jersey from Jordan and Palestinian parents. They moved to Jordan when she was 13 because of increased violence against the Muslim community in the United States. Wow. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's a first. <laughs> yeah. Going back to your home. Co- okay. Yeah. But then her mom fell ill and then they moved back to New Jersey. And then she felt close to, I guess, her Muslim identity for being in Jordan for however many years she was in Jordan. And she just, you know, decided to wear the hijab. But then she just kept being in a Jersey girl. Um, she felt like she wasn't as represented. And, you know, as we all know, representation matters. So following high school, she attended Rutgers University, graduating in 2014 with a political science degree. She worked for a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. before new- moving to New York and working briefly for a major media publication. So in the beginning of 2015, and if I'm doing the math right, when she was only 23 years old, she developed Muslim Girl. She volunteered staff and she saw large increases in leadership. And she did this because she was, again, she was the minority and she really wanted to be an advocate for Muslim women, especially Muslim women living in the United States and then Muslim women living in Jordan and Palestine and what and the, the real life issues that they were facing. In 2016, she partnered with Teen Vogue for a web series that explored issues of concern to young Muslim women. And then in 2017, MuslimGirl.com created Muslim Women's Day to increase representation of Muslim women in media outlets. And that was on March 27th. So still within the Women's Month. Nice. I think someone who was constantly in the news was Malala Yousaf Zai. We Yeah, we all know who you're saying. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so she's a Pakistani education activist, and I think she's been in the news for quite a while as being like um, the youngest activist and, you know, for all the shit that she went through to try and uh, be a voice for for women in education. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good to hear about other women yeah. um, who might not be as famous or as prominent um, – to be made aware of what they're doing. so it's And that so is neat. just women who are, like, so, like some of them are alive still. Some of them died. Like, uh, the pantaloons lady. She's long gone. <laughs> well, gee, if she was still alive, I'd, I'd say that's a fucking miracle. I'd be like, get her on here. Like, how the fuck is she still living? <laughs> she, I'd be kind of worried, Faith. What I'm saying is, there are so many women today in – their own community is in their own local government trying to make yeah. noise and break glass ceilings. Yeah. And they're just – and they're, nobody even knows their names. hmm So yeah. if you have somebody in your life that is doing really great work that is just totally unknown, say thank you. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, yeah. I think there are ways to like nominate in certain categories like people for to get recognized for like, you know, they have um, do good or change dot org or yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure there's an activist society somewhere and it's like you can 
write about what you're doing in your own community, in your own society, um, yeah. and what change you're involved in. I feel like now there's platforms for that, whereas back in the 1800s, like you, you know, they you wouldn't be made aware of what people are doing because oh, news yeah. doesn't travel that fast, but. Um, travels on horseback (laughs) yeah on horseback and you know through the men actually I think the men were the ones that were congregating and talking about the events and stuff and I mean I don't know what David did maybe he went around telling people about his incredible wife who knows but I doubt that that was the case for many people and speaking of so one woman I feel like she wore the pants literally in that relationship she wear the she wore the pantaloons. She wore the pantaloons. I'm wondering actually, is that where she the was, Spanish word for pantalones came from? No, pantaloons is just a universal like is even it? It, yeah, in UK they call their underwear pantaloons and we call it underwear and they call their pants trousers. Yes, I know. Yeah. Wait, so one one woman that I wanted to go over was uh Marie Curie. Oh, yeah. Okay. Do you know her history? Um, I know of her and I know um, she was from Paris and she worked to help discover DNA? Mm, negative. <laughs> no. no um, so actually, she was, she was Polish but naturalized mm. in France. Um, she was a physicist and a chemist who – That's it. Yeah, she worked with her husband actually in conducting pioneering research on radioactivity. So we have her to thank for MRIs and CAT scans and, you know, Mm. x-rays. But she wasn't allowed to get that recognition because at that time it was the men that were smarter and more educated. But she was very much involved in it and she – died from the very thing that she discovered she had this like little piece of radioactive active like mineral or whatever on her nightstand and she would sleep with it every single fucking night not realizing that it was actually poisonous for you and it ultimately killed her which i find is like the ultimate like ironic way of dying i guess like that's how your passion kills you in a sense (laughs) Um, But to her knowledge, like, she didn't know at the time that it was poisonous. And then also there was, like, on the flip side, it's, you know, the Nazis used it to create the bombs and stuff and weapons. So on one side of the world, she was – it was being used for good for medicine. And then on the other side, it was being used for destructive purposes. Well, that brings me to what I said to you, Nate, reminds me of this woman. Her name was – Rosalind Franklin. So everybody knows Francis Crick and James Watson who get the credit for the double helix structure of DNA or the secret of life, as Crick would put it. It wouldn't have happened without Franklin who used her skills in X-ray crystallography Mm. to capture a clear and concise picture of the DNA. Her picture was taken without permission by another scientist, Maurice Wilkins, and shown to Watson, who wrote his memoir. Um, The instant he saw the picture, his mouth fell open and his pulse began to race. In 1958, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins were awarded the the Nobel Prize without any mention or thanks to Franklin. So. Wow, the ultimate copyright infringement. Uh, (laughs) Seriously. Jeez. Yeah. Oh, my God. That sucks. So, to, to kind of wrap this all up, the question is, how can you get involved with International Women's Day or what, you know, what can you do to help support the cause? Everyone, anywhere, no matter where you are, can play a part in helping forge gender equality. A wide range of International Women's Day campaigns, events, rallies, lobbying, performances. You could have festivals, parties, fun runs, celebrations. It's all valid. But if you go to their website, there are so many different resources to figure out what is the best way to get involved, even if, um, you, you know, you throw an event. Or it could be simple, something as simple as using the hashtag Embrace Equity, which is the theme of this, year so, of this year's showcase. And that will draw attention. And so equity ultimately means creating an inclusive world. 
And again, not to be devil's advocate here and, and knock down women. As I get older, I kind of find that inclusivity makes things more exclusive. Yeah, sometimes. I sometimes. think depending not on Not all the, the time, but yeah, it depends on what it is. Depending on the context, yeah. So I kind of wanted to do like a fun game in or- like for International Women's Day. So I went online. I literally Googled fun ways or fun games to celebrate Women's Day. And I clicked this link and I'm not going to tell you the website because it's irrelevant. The first one is essentially truths and a lie. And I thought we can play that and it would be like a little bit more of an icebreaker on us, which is fine. And then they start to get a little preposterous. Like the, the third option is spin the bottle because nothing says International Women's Day like spin the bottle. The game Have You Ever or Never Have You Ever, depending on how you play it. Oh, and a purse scavenger hunt. Like, you know, when you, you have like a check card of everything like would, that would be in a woman's purse and yeah. then you have to like dig through it. And like it's like a bingo. That's something you do at a fucking bridal shower. Why is that part of International Women's Day? And then this is my favorite before we play the game. It's called Blow the Balloons. So you hand a balloon to each woman. And once the the whistle blows, all ladies get to take breaths to literally blow up the balloon in 10 seconds. So the participant that blows the biggest balloon wins. Again, how does this how is this a celebration of women? Yeah, this does a complete disservice to women. Okay. Right. So, let's play the classic icebreaker, two truths and a lie. So, this it's a it's a good way for our new listeners to get to know us a little bit better and um try to play along with us. <laughs> yeah. Um okay, you want to go first? Sure. The first one is I went to school for math education, but somehow ended up working in analytics. Despite growing up Italian American, I actually don't like pasta. And my love of history started in England at age 10 after visiting all the castles. Okay. So I know the first one to be true because you you did go to school for math education and now you're working in analytics and I don't know, doing something with math. The third one I know you traveled quite a bit with your mom when you were younger, and I know you love history, so I'm going to say that's true. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you love your pasta. So the second one, despite growing up in an Italian-American household, I actually don't like pasta. I think that's false. You do like pasta. Yes, I do. I love (laughs) pasta. And you're right. And also, if other listeners remember, uh, during our Valentine's Day newlywed game, your husband said that all you cook is pasta. (laughs) It was just not true. He's just being a fucking jackass. Today I cooked tacos for Taco Tuesday. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Tell me a little bit about England. I always wanted to visit. Oh, I love England. England is just, I just love it. I just, oh my God. England, especially London. London has kind of like the same vibe as New York. A little bit different. But if there was any city that you would want to travel to or you wanted to live in because you love New York so much and you don't want to give up that New York vibe, v- vibe, it London's it. It's mm-hmm. London. So my mom's best friend growing up, it was like her pen pal since they were 14, lived in in England. Our first time, well, my first time over the pond, We I was 10. And, we, you know, we got to go to um, – Heaver Castle and then another castle. Heaver Castle was Anne Boleyn's family home and I think we all know the story of Anne Boleyn. But then, you know, the whole Tudors, like the whole the Tudor family and then King Henry VIII and his wives and then um, his first wife who was actually married to his brother and then his brother died and it was like this whole big thing. I, I read about them and then I read about other powerful families throughout history and I think here in America, we do have a lot of history. We don't have like a monarchy history. So we don't have these like castles and these torture chambers. And then even like you go when we would go to like Italy or France or wherever we were, we would went to just like going into these basilicas are Mm -hmm. again, I'm not a religious person, but these basilicas will just blow your mind like the the ornate details of them and. There's the the acoustics, how they're you can you're able to like talk from one end of the room and it just your sound carries through and it just the 
it's just kind of hauntingly beautiful. Yeah, honestly. I think that's like, why I, if I have a chance to travel, it won't be like within the United States yeah. because we don't have a long history as Europe does. And so there are not that many impressive churches or buildings yeah to see. there's a few like in new york we have the saint patrick's cathedral which is really nice but yeah but again it's new york <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's no really other place i want to visit in the states that has like i don't know i get there is a significance in the history of the united states and you know there yeah. are still places i want to visit but it doesn't carry a magnitude Oh, yeah. Like sure. it does in Europe. And I think that's why every time I go with Lucas, he's like so not impressed with anything that we do in the States. And even um, he's not easily impressed anyway. In general? In general. He's like, oh, you've seen one church in Europe. You've seen them all. Like he's not Fuck very no, into no. that. <laughs> um, but you the guys one of them. go to Italy. Like you guys got to go yeah. to like Florence has like an amazing basilica. I, I think the problem is, like, he doesn't really appreciate architecture. Um, to him, it's all the same. Like, he's just not that type. Yeah. He doesn't no, have that I type of amazing. visualization or conception. But one of the, the most amazing churches I've seen so far was actually um, La Sagrada Familia. In I want to go there. The Gaudi. The, the yeah. Gaudi. Yes. I want to go there so bad. It looks yeah. amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I was mesmerized. We were sitting there for like two hours and I was just looking at the ceiling and like, like you were saying, the ac- acoustics like play a major role in it. Yeah. And just the whole, I mean, the whole concept of it, because he wanted it to mimic nature and like tall trees and stuff. And so that's where he came up with the concept. And so the outside looks completely different from the inside. Um, but yeah, that's one of the most amazing places. And also in Poland, there were beautiful, I forgot the names of it, um, but in Krakow, there were a couple like really magnificent ones that I've seen. Um, we went to, like, we went to Westminster Abbey, which is amazing, but people, and then we went to St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. So I love churches of that magnitude because I just think they're very, again, they're very detailed. The The architecture is amazing. It's the history of those churches, the history within that church that yeah. just, like, carries, right? And I can, and we could talk about history and art, church, in in building like i don't care i could talk about history all day but london is amazing okay um so my two truths and a lie ready yes in middle school i was almost the lead character in the play don quixote de la mancha which if you ask me now i don't even remember what it's about um i met the former french president's son and mentored him for one day before he decided to quit the u.n internship and then my last one is I almost got married to a Russian expat living in China. So I know you met the former French president's son and I know you did tutor him or mentor mm-hmm. him because that's a really funny story. Or, I wouldn't say mentored him. I'd say trained him. You almost got married to, to a Russian expat living in China and then in middle school. I'm going to say – it, I'm going to say that the because you and I didn't meet in middle school because you were in Israel still at the time. Nope. I was – well, yes and no. I came back to the States in the middle of eighth grade. Oh, okay. So I would say in – that one's true, being almost the lead character in Don Quixote, but you definitely didn't get married or almost married. <laughs> You would have told me that. Yeah. Um, I did not almost get married because I didn't agree to it. <laughs> um, Consent is everything, people. Consent. Yeah. Um, so actually, it's the same friend that took me out for International Women's Day. <laughs> um, so yeah, Why we met. Old story? I don't think that marriage was going to work out. <laughs> Probably not. Um <laughs> Yeah, we met through some other, like, mutual friends that we were hanging out with. And, you know, I'm Russian and I speak a little bit of it. So Are you? There, yeah. So no, there I'm are not. some <laughs> – so there are a lot of Russians coming to China um, to study. 
And so there's a huge population of them. And so I got kind of like the in crowd. Um, and I started hanging out with this one Russian guy. And the conversation was basically, I want to go live in the States because I only have two options. I either join the Russian military or stay in China. And he was like, neither of those options are great for me. And he has family members in the States and stuff, but it was just a matter of getting that visa or um, yeah. green card. And so he was just joking, but not joking. And he's like, oh, you know, we should get married. I'll take I'll take good care of you, this and that. Like my family lives in California, blah, blah, blah. Um, I would really only agree if it was extenuating circumstances. Like if you were – in an asylum or like a refugee or, you know, like, and plus I hadn't known him for that long either. So I wouldn't trust anyone in that regard. I'd really only do it for like people I really know that are in a bind kind of thing. But anyway, it worked out for the best. And he, he actually did end up coming to the States one way or another a couple of years later. So yay. Good for um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so even though I, at the age of 13, in the middle of eighth grade, I came back to the States. I was obsessed with Spanish. Like, I was practically fluent in it because I learned Spanish through watching TV, Argentinian TV in Israel. When they asked me if I wanted to have a language class, I was like, yes, absolutely, Spanish. So, But they put me in seventh grade Spanish thinking that I didn't know anything. And it ended up being that I know too many complicated things. Like, I didn't know how to say a fork or a knife, but I knew how to say I'm pregnant and you're not the father, <laughs> thanks to a lot of the telenovelas. And so the teacher <laughs> caught on pretty fast that I knew Spanish. And she was like, I want you to be in this play. And like, I had horrible stage fright. And I agreed to be in the play by playing like the maid or whatever, or, like the person who brought in the food during the dinner scene and I couldn't even do that like I I got there I froze I dropped the plate and I ran the fuck out of there and I was like well I'm not gonna be a theater nerd that's for sure um she so went that, out a legend folks yeah exactly um the last fact um I met the former French president's son and trained him for a day yes so there was a bit of gossip going around when I was doing the internship and People were like, oh, my God, we're going to get someone famous. Um, they're going to be an intern here. And I'm like, OK, cool. And my supervisor at the time was kind of freaking out, too, because she was, you know, her supervisor was on her tail and wanted to make sure everything went perfectly. And so they wouldn't tell me who it was until like the day of. And I came in and they're like, oh, my God, you're not going to believe who's here. And I'm like, who? And so they told me. And I'm like, OK, great. I don't really know who that is. And you, and you were like, who? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so... I got to spend the day with him and basically, you know, kind of tell him what was going on, what we were doing. And he wanted to hear more about like my experience in China. So I told him that, you know, I volunteered there, this and that. I traveled. And he's like, oh, that's so cool. I want to do the same thing. You know, my girlfriend right now is in, I think it was Kenya. Um, and he's like thinking of joining her. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And so, you know, the day goes on. I learned a little bit more about him and the fact that he went to like a military school upstate and he loves the United States government. He hates France. He doesn't want to go back, you know, this and that. So I come home and it's like eight or nine at night and I get a phone call from my supervisor saying, you're never going to believe this. And I said, what? And she's like, he quit. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? So he sends her like a very professional cordial email saying that, you know, after figuring out what the role is really about and what his obligations would, he doesn't feel like um, it's up his alley. So she calls bullshit right away and she calls him and she's like, what's really going on? And he's like, oh, well, after spending the day with Isabella and hearing about her experience, you know, it really encouraged me to volunteer myself and go and be with my girlfriend. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, are you serious? Like, he's really making me the scapegoat now? Like, are you kidding? Does he realize, like, he can't just, like, up and leave and just go there in, like, a worn, torn country right now and, and think that he's going to, what, volunteer out of <laughs> the goodness of his heart? Like, you know, I could tell you what he never did. Kenya? Exactly. <laughs> So I, I Googled him a couple of years later and I was like, I don't know what he's up to now since he, you know, his career in, in uh, international development didn't go anywhere. He started a shoe business, like a designer shoe business, um, the Makassans. 
Anyway, he's. Oh, he's I mean, cute. I'm, yeah, he's a very good looking guy. He's very polite. He bought me lunch, you know. Um, it was it was cool to learn about his like military experience and stuff. So today <laughs> we discussed quite a bit random stuff. Um, but anyway, given all you know now about International Women's Day and Women's Month and these incredible stories about the women who made history, but they might not be known or that known as some other women. What is your takeaway from today's episode? I think as a woman, I think that we came from nothing and we did have to like fight for equal rights and just equality. And we're, we, you know, we're still going, we're still progressing, but I feel like I don't know what feminism means today. You ask any woman what feminism means, they're going to give you a completely different answer. It's not something that you can define. So I think that women should empower other women. I think that they should let women rise up and women shouldn't be the competition, but neither should be the man. I think that you're going to have to just compete with yourself, whether you're a female or a male, you have to break your own glass ceilings or you have to have make your own choices. Being a woman in today in 2023 is probably the most confusing shit there is. I think that's where we are. I would yeah, I would agree with everything that you said and it was well put. It is extremely confusing to define what feminism is now versus what the inception of it was. Which is why I didn't have a clear answer to begin with either. But my takeaway from the episode is that there are some pretty amazing women out there that are doing good that might not get the recognition, but maybe they don't want it. You know, yeah. maybe they're just doing it because this is what is instilled in them and this is their passion and then this is what they want to do. And those little changes within their communities or um, within the country is enough for them. Yeah. And – I think that's pretty awesome. Like you don't always, you know, they say like if you're being modest about your involvement and intentions and you're being humble, then you're being praised for it as well. Yeah. So that's not to say you don't deserve all the awards that might be coming your way and stuff. But I I honestly don't think people do that for that reason. Yeah. Um, I think they do it because they are well intentioned. They want to do it. Yeah. They want to do it or they had some sort of experience themselves that it molded them. And, you know, I don't know when all these like Nobel Peace Prizes came to be, but I, I guarantee you in the 18th century they didn't have that. I think now we're we're putting a prize on everything and that also puts pressure on a lot of women. And like we were joking earlier, like shit, like <laughs> these women are some of them are our age or even younger and they're doing incredible things. But what are we doing? You know, yeah, binging and watching Netflix and what hanging out on the weekends at bars and how are we contributing to society? But I it goes to what I said earlier, where not everyone is meant to be that person like. Oh, yeah. you might you may might be making small changes and making waves within your own group of friends and not even know it. And I think we need to just stop comparing ourselves. And like you said, encouraging yeah. women who do amazing things do want to be the change, then be the change. Like if you like you were saying earlier, if you want to celebrate Women's Day by doing those small things and and getting into the movement and and volunteering or being involved in certain groups, um, do it. With, nobody's telling yeah, you you can't. No one's telling you you can't. There's always time, and I don't think it's ever too late. So we hoped you enjoyed today's episode about Women's International Day, and we know it's coming up, so we want to celebrate women, and we want to say happy International Women's Day. <laughs> and go read about all the kick-ass women in history because I guarantee you won't be disappointed, and if anything, you'll probably be – motivated you'll be encouraged you'll be motivated um and it's just amazing what people are capable of women especially uh we hope you continue to uh stay with to listen to our podcast in the future as always we we like to hear input feedback comments review us on Apple Pod. We are available on all major uh, streaming services. You can find our website at itwillcometome.buzzsprout.com. We update our Instagram page or try to <laughs> every week. Um, we're a work in progress. We're working on it. Um, IWCTM Pod or email us if you have any cool stories that you want us to share 
at IWCTM22 at gmail.com. So thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoyed it. Until next time. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.